see if we can get this plane off the ground. If I just start talking spiritually, eventually I'll get into the flow of it. Cynthia was laughing at me because I'm back there fidgeting. She goes, girl, girl. I'm the kind of person when something makes me nervous, I want to kill it. I want it out of my way. I don't want it there anymore. So it's kind of like, let me just get up and do this. Well, uh, I want to start out by saying that, um, you know, I don't know if a lot of y'all know that, but a lot of the people who came to this church initially, years ago, were uh, singles. We used to be a primarily single church. And I know I came, gosh, 12 years ago. And I'd been saved maybe two years. Oh, and you want to talk about a mess. And I came to this church, and it was primarily people around my age who a lot of them were as big a mess or almost as much or at least could relate to me. And um, it was probably the first place I had ever been where I felt accepted. And um, during the worship time, I started having some of the, the old feeling the spirit in the same way that I used to feel it. You know, and I'm nervous, so I'd feel it for a second, and then I would <laughs> get nervous. But um, I just remember the way I used to feel Jesus in the body years ago when um, I was hurting. And um, it was, uh, it was, I mean, I wish I could put it into words. And I started thinking about the body and something I read. Um, by Watchman Nee. I was reading Watchman Nee's biography, and if y'all don't know who Watchman Nee is, he was a evangelist in China in the early part of the century who eventually was imprisoned for his faith, was in prison for 20 years, and uh, died in prison. And his incredible testimony, he led everybody but one person in his high school to the Lord. And of course, I'm sure his high school wasn't very big. I, in fact, I know how big it was. It was 70 people. Because it, it read in his testimony, he said... He'd witnessed to these people and no one got saved. So he went to a spiritual mentor and he said, why is no one getting saved? And he says, you need to pray. So he went home and made a list of everybody and he prayed for them and nothing happened. So he went back and she goes, you need to be patient. So he went back and continued to pray and sure enough, they all eventually came around. And I think that that's a real testimony about prayer. And um, that's what I want to talk a little bit about today is prayer. But, um, you know, uh, one thing that he said was that what God God does not want is individuals walking in a powerful, overcoming walk. He said what he wants is a powerful, overcoming church. And um, I think that revelation has been lost to our society a lot. But I could really, I could really sense it today. The reason why he would want that is because to have a, a powerful, overcoming church would mean that our individual egos would all have to die. And so it just today I could just see how it made sense how, you know, it, it has to do with God in us because then it's not about any one of us. And there's such a special feeling... I don't think I've ever actually drank any of the water. I think I'll try that. Okay. There's such a special feeling of freedom when it's God in us rather than all about me and my walk. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, I was uh, reading in a one-year Bible. How many people here read a one-year Bible? I really like it. I've gotten, you know, I've really gotten to. I really enjoy it. And um, I was reading in it, and I started thinking about, you know, who believes that you could have the kind of walk with the Lord that some of these Old Testament saints have? Do you believe that that could happen to you? You know, uh, you know, intellectually, I guess I believe it, but I don't think I really do. I mean, you almost relegate these guys to the to the status of legendary. You know. They're not really real. What happened to them is not really real. It wasn't about just a, a person like you or me who had this extraordinary walk with the Lord. And I started kind of thinking about their people's prayer life. Actually, it was when I was reading about Moses I was thinking about this. And what made Moses' prayer life the way it was? 
And I, and I started thinking about other people, like, if you all remember the story of Abraham, and I'm not going to have you turn here right now, but the story of Abraham, you know, there's some really weird stories in the Bible. You know, Abraham is visited by these three men one day, and he feeds them, talks to them, and as they're walking away, Abraham goes, where are you going? And they said, we're going to go destroy Sodom. <laughs> And so, you know, Abraham reaches over there, and he begins essentially to intercede for Sodom. You know, he says, if X number of righteous people are found there, will you not? And then it says, in the middle of it says, and the Lord said to him. Well, it hasn't mentioned it before that he's talking to the Lord, and you kind of go, the Lord. And it's just a strange story. You kind of want to know, you know, but who knows? All I know is that the man had an extraordinary experience with the Lord and interceding for Sodom. And you start thinking, well, what happens if we could do that? I mean, you could go to the Lord and say, Lord, would you not destroy America if X number of righteous people were found in it? And um, hopefully that if we, you know, we'd have a happier ending than Sodom had. <laughs> uh, X number of righteous people were not found in Sodom. Or, um, or here's one. How about Solomon? If y'all remember when Solomon dedicated the temple, Solomon built the temple that David had wanted to build, and Solomon dedicated it. And when he dedicated it, he prayed this prayer. And if any of you read the one-year Bible, you know that the prayer is a very long prayer. He just prays and prays and prays and prays. And you just think about those poor people standing and going, okay, okay. But at the end of the prayer, he makes a simple request of the Lord, and that it was that the Lord would dwell in the temple. He says, Lord, would you come and dwell here in this temple that we built for you and fire falls from the sky burns up the altar and the glory of God fills the temple I mean whoa have you ever have you ever had that kind of experience praying I mean think about it you're in your bedroom and you pray what do you do call your homeowners you know it's, it's an act of God I don't know I was just praying fire came from the sky and burnt up my my bed and <laughs> Or Daniel, you know, Daniel's praying. His people have been in captivity for 70 years. He's grieved for them. He's a righteous man. He has withstood the culture and the spirit of the age for many years. He's praying, and nothing happens. And then a few weeks later, into the room, bursts this being, kind of brushes itself off. Says, I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> I had an encounter with the Prince of Persia. <laughs> I've never had that happen when I'm praying. <laughs> but you think about that. I mean, does the Prince of Persia maybe need an encounter today? Think about it. You're on your knees praying. A couple of weeks later, the being burst into your room and says, you know, sorry. Ran into some trouble over Iraq, you know. And a few weeks later, you know, Saddam falls. And, you know, who knows? But can these things happen? They happened before. But I think that the prayer life that, uh, that really most impressed me was Moses. And I want to look, first of all, at uh, Numbers chapter 14. See, I think that God... When he answers these prayers that we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I think that God is responding to his people and that God wants to respond to his people and that God wants us to have a walk that will affect the world around us. And the way that's going to happen is for him to respond to us. You know, it's the you go first kind of thing. And I think that we can have a much more powerful walk on people around us than we really realize. And, you know, I think he responds to different things in, in different people. Like in Abraham, Abraham was the father of faith. And I think he was responding to Abraham's faith, that Abraham would go to the Lord and ask him. And I think God responds to our faith. I don't know how many times I've had God answer my prayers, and it was because he responds to faith. It's not because of me or my character, but because I went to him and asked him. It pleases him, and he responds to that. I think in Daniel's life, he may have been responding a lot to uh, Daniel's righteousness and Daniel's courage in facing the culture of the air. I think that brought an anointing on Daniel's life that caused the Lord to be able to really respond to Daniel. Um, but I think there's something in Moses that has the most effect on God than anything else. Um, if you look at verse 11... 
See, this is um, the story that you all are familiar with of the unbelief and the unfaithfulness of the Israelite people as the Lord is trying to bring them out of captivity into the promised land. And once again, the people have rebelled against the Lord. And the Lord goes to Moses and he says, How long will this people despise me and how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with pestilence and disinherit them. And then the Lord basically says, My judgment is coming on them, and Moses, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. And in verse uh, 13 it says, But Moses said to the Lord, basically he says all the reasons why he believes that God should not do this. And he says, if you skip over to verse 19, Please pardon the iniquity of the people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people now from Egypt and now. And I love this. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. I mean, that sounds like something we should say to the Lord. According to your word, I have done. But the Lord says this to a man. He says, I have done according to your word. And I wonder what it is about Moses to where the Lord would do Moses' bidding. He's got the God of all creation doing his bidding here. And it's just an amazing thing. Turn back to Exodus 32. We have the same thing uh, in verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, and this is when, um, this is the first incident when he comes down with the Ten Commandments and they're worshiping the golden calf. And the Lord says uh, to Moses, Go down for your people whom you brought up. He says, Whom you. Notice he didn't say, Whom I. He's disinherited them. He says, Whom you have brought up out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside out of the way I commanded them and made for themselves a golden calf. And then verse 11 says, But Moses implored the Lord and said, O oh Lord, you know, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out? He reminds him who really brought him out. He does not take the responsibility. <laughs> he goes, No, wait, whom you have brought out. And why should the Egyptians say, You weren't able, you wouldn't do it? In other words, he's more concerned about the Lord's glory here. And then it says in verse 14, the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. And then turn over one chapter to chapter 33, verse 11. And it describes the relationship that's going on between Moses and the Lord here. It says, then the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. See, I think what was special about Moses' relationship with the Lord was the friendship, the intimacy. That there was an intimacy and a closeness and relationship between Moses and the Lord. See, you know, the Lord responds to our faith. He always will. He responds to our righteousness. But there's something beyond and past that that the Lord wants for us. It's an intimate it's a relationship. It's a friendship. It's a trust. It's an understanding of one another face to face that he wants to bring us to. And um, it reminds me, a long time ago I read a novel. I don't remember the name of it, and I don't remember much about the plot. I just remember this one part of it where the girl who is the, the main character falls down and hits her head, and she goes into this kind of dream world. And the whole book, I remember, was about this woman's relationship with the Lord and trying to bring her to faith. And in this dream world, she's in the woods, and there's someone pursuing her. And she's deathly afraid, and she's trying to get away from this person who is pursuing her. There's some man pursuing her. And she meets another man in the forest, and this man wants to help her get away from her pursuer, so he keeps helping her. But as the story goes on, she begins to realize that the man who is pursuing her is actually pursuing her for her good. And it turns out to be an allegory. The man pursuing her was the Lord, and the one trying to help her get away from him was the devil. You know, it kind of flips around on itself. And I thought, you know, I really I thought that's so true. You know, we spend time having quiet times and pursuing the Lord, but there is something inside of us that is so afraid of 
intimacy and closeness. So afraid, uh, and, and we cover it up in so many different ways. Now, if you'll turn to Numbers 12, I'll tell you what the secret of Moses' intimacy with the Lord. It, it shows it very clearly, and we have all, all know this. Numbers 12, verse 3. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us all? You know, this is a story where Miriam and Aaron are rebelling against him. But this one thing down in verse 3 says, Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. See, the key to the intimacy with the Lord was his meekness. And it says he was more meek than anyone else on earth. It only goes to follow that he would move in more power than anyone else on earth. And I really do believe that meekness is the key to having that kind of intimacy. Intimacy is the key to being able to move the hand of the Lord. And so the key to power is meekness. I want to tell you something interesting about meekness. Um, I looked it up in the dictionary. And it said all the usual things it would say. It would say submission, willingness to yield. But then it said something else. It said spineless. Use the word spineless in the regular dictionary. And I thought, well, Jesus said he was meek and lowly. Is it spineless to go to the cross? Do you think that there's a misunderstanding here? And it kind of bothered me. And so uh, Lindy had emailed us the address of this Webster's, what is it, 19, 18, 1829? Anyhow, the dictionary that uh, the dictionary originally was written, and they used a lot of biblical terms to explain words rather than the way they do now. And uh, it explained meekness. It said, um, in an evangelical sense, humility, resignation, submission to the divine will, without murmuring or peevishness. But then it gave a very a very interesting sentence. It said, meekness is a grace which Jesus alone inculcated and which no ancient philosopher seems to have understood or recommended. See, what, <laughs> what they do in these definitions is they go back into classical times and they try to come up with what different famous people said about it to try to explain it. Well, they looked back and they said nobody either understood it or recommended it. Now you think about that. Jesus called himself meek. It was the only thing he ever said about himself. The character trait that is most like God is totally not even able to be comprehended by the world. The world doesn't even understand meekness. They don't, they don't get it. And it just made the scripture in John where it says, The light came into the world and the darkness comprehended it not. You know, in First John. It just made that make sense. The darkness didn't even comprehend it. Meekness is so against this world and what this world is about and what is in our flesh. It is the opposite of Satan. It is the opposite of the satanic fallen nature. It cannot even be comprehended by it. I mean, I ask, was it spineless to go to the cross? You know, a lot of people would say yes. And a lot of people at that time said yes. You know, if you're God, come down. You must be, you know. And Jesus said, am I a worm and no man? He understood. You know, a lot of people in other religions, I think specifically the Muslim religion, reject the notion of Christ. They said, you know, God's Son did not die on the cross. And they say, he would never have come as a baby. You know, there's something about the flesh and about humanity that is uh, very humbling. Um, if you'll turn, I'm getting way out of order here, but that's okay. To Philippians 2. Philip to Philippians. Well. See, I want to talk about humanity. See, a lot of the problems that we have in our life is caused by um, our pride. You know, what, what got me thinking about this was I read something by C.S. Lewis, and um, he basically 
was trying to draw a picture of pride and he drew a picture of someone scraping and cleaning themselves trying to make themselves pure and he described them as barren and these people were trying to keep anything from touching them that would make them dirty but it wasn't a holiness it was a false holiness it had to do with pride and you know being a human being is a humbling thing you know being in the flesh you know the flesh gets fat gets spot wrinkles you know it's it's a a humbling thing and and we uh, struggle against our own humanity we are constantly trying to come across as better than we are we're constantly trying to hide our weaknesses and hide the areas that we um, are most sensitive about and we're fearful that people will see the things in us that we have rejected ourselves for um, I'm trying to find Philippians I keep going past it there we go it just you know thinking about these things just gave these scriptures um, a lot more meaning to me here in Philippians 2 where it says um, in verse 5 have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form I mean how how far God has humbled himself I mean, I, I was talking about this to Bo, and Bo goes, yeah, you think the Lord ever go, looked at, looked at himself, and oh no, it's a pimple. You know, you think he's God, and you, th- you don't think about things like that, but he put him himself in a position to really have that kind of a problem. He came in the flesh, you know? He came in a, in a position to where people could laugh at the way he looked, if he was funny looking, or look down on him if he didn't have the right social graces. You know, or sneer at him if if he didn't have the proper education. You know, he put himself in, in a human form, and uh, that exemplifies meekness. Do you think that most people's version of God that they have in their head would fit that? You know, God. We're all power hungry. We're all desirous of being in a place where no one can ever reject us or laugh at us or think less of us than our pride demands. You know. And he was in such a position, and he made himself the laughing stock of the world. I mean, he was ridiculed and mocked on that cross in such a way that to me would be far more excruciating than the physical pain would be. You know, the the rejection of him, and he put himself in a position where he didn't have to be. You know, there's something in that that uh, that should make us a little less worried about ourselves. And a little bit less worried about whether we're gonna we're gonna mess up. Um, one of the things that made me start thinking along these lines was I'm reading I, I finished reading um, the Pursuit of God by A. W. Tozer. I know y'all were reading that, and that's such a good book. I recommend that book. But he started talking about he's got a way of kind of nailing you. He started talking about pretense, the sin of pretense. And pretense basically means a holding out to others something false or feigned, usually with a view to conceal what is real and thus to deceive. That's the definition of the dictionary. And his comment was, there's hardly a man alive who dares to be just what he is without doctoring up the impression. And I know I don't. You know, I know that I have a lot of fear, and the fear is directly related to being exposed for all the things I don't want to be exposed for. And, um, you know, I've recently just really started crying out to the Lord, you got to do something about that, because I know that no real anointing or power can flow through me when that's in place, when I'm concerned about that. You've got to be free to flow from here, you know, and there's something in me. It's you know, and it's um, and it's um, it's pride, you know. Um, I saw a definition here that said humility is being willing to be known for who you are. Pride is trying to be known for who you are not. You know, hoping hoping people will think of you what you 
want them to think of you rather than them just seeing you for the plain little old van- vanilla you are, or even worse, you know. And um, for some reason, that's always been a real struggle in my life. Now, I'll ask y'all a trick question. How many of y'all struggle with low self-esteem? Yeah. Well, in a lot of cases, low self-esteem is caused by a lot of different things. But one thing that we need to be sure of, I mean, it, I mean, let's face it. If your parents don't give you a reflection of love and concern, then you're going to grow up a little bit needy in that area. But the one thing that it can be is a lot of times that can be just our pride. <clears throat> uh, there's a guy named Lauren Cunningham who started YWAM, which is Youth with Youth with a Mission. Is that right, YWAM? It always sounds funny, Youth with a Mission. Anyhow, um, <laughs> kind of almost sounds ominous. Um, um, but he had a quote in here. I want to read it. It says, "Sometimes pride is manifested in a low view of ourselves rather than an exalted one." The more humility a person has, the greater true self-worth he has. Now think about that. The greater humility a person has, the more true self-worth he has. Pride is choosing to be deceitful about who you really are. It destroys self-esteem, making you insecure. Now think about that. I mean, insecurity is caused by pride. It's, it was there first. Um, it is not true to say I'm worthless. You are made in the image of God. It says when you have God's view of yourself, you can be secure and transparent with others. And see, I think transparency is what the Lord is after in us. And I think that transparency is what Moses had with the Lord. I think Moses was past trying to be anything big. Moses was just a lump of clay. God was what was big in Moses' view. And therefore the Lord didn't have to worry about Moses. And he tested him over and over and over again. And said, Moses, these people, and they deserved it. You know, anybody's sense of justice would say these people should have been deserved. They, you know, they could not have been any more rebellious or obstinate. And, And the Lord would go to Moses and say, I will destroy them and make of you a nation. If there had been any pride in Moses at all do you think he could have resisted that over and over again maybe the first time or if he's like me he may have resisted the first time and been proud of the fact that he resisted it yeah (laughs) wow that was really mature of me (laughs) this quote that I just read where it talks about um, self esteem reminds me of an example of this in the Old Testament in Saul and David I wanted to look at that because Saul and David said some similar things to each other. I mean, uh, yeah, Saul and David. If you'll turn to 1 Samuel 9. I think these are examples of what uh, pride and true humility are. When Samuel came to Saul and told Saul that the Lord had chosen him to be the first king of Israel. 1 Samuel 9, 21. This was uh, Saul's response. Saul said, Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? In other words, who am I to be the king of Israel? Now, is this humility or is this pride? I want to look at um, something that David said and compare the two. In Second, First uh, Samuel 24, just skip over to chapter 24. In verse 14, Saul has just invited David to become Saul is king now, and he's just invited David to become his son-in-law, son-in-law of the king. This is shepherd boy, right? 
And in verse 14, oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, I'm sorry. Go back to chapter 18, verse 23. David responded to Saul's invitation to become his son-in-law by saying, Does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law since I'm a poor man and have no reputation? You see, he said something similar to Saul when Saul was invited to be king. Kings, you know, they both said, Who am I to have this great honor? bestowed upon me and later on when Saul was pursuing David David kept saying to him who do you pursue a flea a dead dog and there was, who am I why are you making such a big deal over me to pursue me you're the king of Israel why would you pursue me they both responded in likewise but I want to show you that there is a difference and you can see the difference through uh, subsequent things that happen in their life um Look at 1 Samuel, verse 10. I'm going to have you all flip around 1 Samuel here. Verse 21. They're getting ready to make Saul king. They're about to anoint him. They brought all Israel together. It's all in his honor. It says, Then Samuel brought all the tribes and they're throwing lots to see who would be king. And Saul's chosen. It said, And Saul the son of Kish was taken by Lot, but when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? They thought, It can't be him. He's not around. Then they ran and they took him from where he stood among the people. He was taller than them and had hidden among the baggage. He had hidden himself among the baggage. All right, now think about that. Hold that in your mind. Saul, when he's honored and they're about to raise him up, hides. That's his response. I think that's a type of the way we try to hide ourselves. I think that's a type of the way we put out masks and obscure who we really are. Because I think Paul, uh, Saul's problem was he was desperately afraid of what people thought of him. And was afraid to put himself forth. And his life bears witness of that as over and over again. He felt the need to move in control jealousy, insecurity. He was terribly insecure. He was insecure because he was afraid of what people thought of him. That's what ruled his life. And he was desperately afraid that people would find in him the thing that he saw, his weakness. He did not understand that it didn't really matter about his weakness. That there's not any of us among here that's not weak. That what mattered about Saul was that God had chosen him. And that's all that mattered. But he didn't realize that. He thought he had to be somebody. And he spent his whole life trying to be somebody. To where he moved in abject witchcraft. But I know this is not the case of David. Because of the fruit of David's life. And because David wrote Psalm 139. And I think Psalm 139 has the best example of what real self-worth is. If you'll turn to Psalm 139. <clears throat> See, first of all, in the first 13 verses, David describes the kind of relationship he has with the Lord, the intimacy. Listen to the openness he has. He goes, Oh Lord, you have searched me and you've known me. In other words, he's allowed himself to be known by God. He's not hiding anything from God, he's not trying to be something he's not. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all of my ways. He's talking about a level of intimacy with the Lord that is scary. He says, you you hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Oh, did I miss verse 4? Even before a, tongue, a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. That's, that is scary. You hid me in behind me before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. 
If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. When I first came around here, I had a friend here. And this, this psalm was kind of a joke with us because we were well aware of the fact that we were, we were trying desperately to get out of here. There was a part of us that did not like being exposed. There was a part of us that was so afraid. It's Kelly. <laughs> and we used to laugh about this. We used to go, where can I flee from the Lord? If I go in my bathroom, they're there. Because <laughs> when we came to this church and we were being discipled, you know, if I, if I hide under my bed, they will seek me out. <laughs> where can I flee from your presence, Lord? We spent a lot of time trying to flee from the presence, but we didn't, must not have wanted to flee too bad. And here I still am, you know. But it's scary. It's so scary. I don't know about y'all, but when you come in and you've known a lot of hurt and your rejection, it is a fearful thing to come into a group of people. And um, and the scary thing is, is it doesn't easily go away. You know, he breaks it bit by bit, but he keeps bringing up those deep layers of pride and self-sufficiency in places you don't want people to see. And then it's even worse because you've been here a while and you're supposed to have it all together. <laughs> You know, and you know you got you, you you think you need to walk a little maturity, you know. So how do you walk in maturity and 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 just you know be the basket case you really are? At the same time, you know, how do you balance the the, the humility and the and the you know? All right, I can't be a basket case every day. It's got to be somebody else's turn to be a basket case today. We at least at least need to take turns here, you know. And I think the confusion just comes because true meekness is so foreign. You know, it's something that the Lord teaches us as we walk day by day with the Lord. But anyhow, uh, David goes on, and then he comes down to, where am I looking for? Here we go. He comes down to 13, and he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now there's, I mean, is that pride? Who's he praising? And David's no big deal. You know, David's just a, a piece of dirt. But on the other hand, David's a creation of God. And God does all things well. And nothing has he done better than the creation of man. He made man in his own image. I mean, this is nothing to sneer at. I don't know who we think we are sometimes. To have these thoughts about ourselves and to believe these lies as though it had anything to do with what I make me has everything to do with what he made me. And all that matters is what he made me. And if I'm embarrassed and afraid for people to see what he made, then I'm embarrassed and afraid of him. If I'm embarrassed and afraid to see what I have made me, well, then that's just pride. That's just pride. Who cares? In the long run, who cares? You know, it's like I get nervous about getting up here and doing this. And this morning I said, Lord, I'm nervous. And the Lord said, you know, it's really not a big deal. <laughs> What's the big deal? Well, okay, if you put it that way. A big deal to me. What's a big deal? You know, it's a big deal because I have pride. You know, otherwise it's not because, you know, what are we? We're a body that loves each other and that cares about each other and does not have to have it all together. And when we get to a real revelation of that, a real revelation of that, I think that the Spirit of the Lord is going to be able to dwell here in a really, really more powerful way, a really rich way, you know, because it's going to be all about Him, and we're just going to be a bunch of, you know, potential disasters that He's in control of at all times, you know. Um... But you see the difference between Saul and David? You know, both of them said, essentially, I'm nobody. One spent their whole life trying to cover up the fact that they thought they were nobody, and the other decided they didn't care what anybody thought. Yeah, if God wanted it, God was in control. And the fruit of their lives, you'd have to say, is essentially very different. Um... You know, another example, I'm just wondering if I want to go into this, but another example is Mary and Martha. You know, we all know the story of Mary and Martha, but I think that the reason why Martha was so busy was because Martha didn't want to be seen. 
She was hiding. And if you remember, Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Sitting at Jesus' feet is a very exposed place to be. You know, sit at Jesus' feet, and he sees that. He saw that thought. He knows that attitude. He knows that thing that you did when you were 12 that you never told anybody. You know, and you squirm, and you don't like it. You know, he sees that. You know, but she sat there at Jesus' feet. Look, when the God of the universe has seen it all and said, I love you, what does it matter anymore? Is that not freedom? I mean, is there anything to hide then? And you can see later on <clears throat> the difference in those two women's life. In fact, why don't we look at it in Second John 11. Made, in fact, because this is really what um, the point I want to get across is how humility leads to intimacy. I'm sorry, did I say Second John? That's because it is the second thing on my little outline. It's really John 11. This is the story of Lazarus. See, Mary developed intimacy with Jesus because she allowed herself to be seen for the way she really was, and she wasn't busy trying to, to do or to fix or to clean up. And, and I want to show the different ways that God responds to these women. Um, Lazarus is dead, and Jesus has deliberately delayed his coming. Because he wants God's glory to be shown in a special way in this instance, he finally ends up in Bethany. Lazarus' sister, Mary and Martha, meet him. The first person who meets him is Martha. In verse 26, it says, So so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went in to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. See, Jesus responded to Martha. He responded to her by speaking truth to her. He said, Martha, you have been full of agendas and other things, and your eyes are on the wrong thing. It does not matter whether someone dies. It doesn't matter whether someone lives. One thing matters, and that's that I am. I am the beginning. I am the end. I am everything. And if you've got your eyes on the result, the result being you wanted your brother well, then I have disappointed you, haven't I? And you wonder if there wasn't a bit of incrimination in what she said to him. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. Where were you? Right? And he's trying to get something in her. I think, you know, it may have been the whole reason he waited. It was not just for Lazarus, but for Martha. He's trying to get something in her. He's saying, it doesn't matter. I am. I am. It's me. You're putting your faith in everything being okay the way you understand it. You're putting your faith in the results of your prayer coming out the way you want. And you're not looking. You're missing it. You've got an agenda. Right? So he speaks truth to her. He responds to this woman. He loves her. And he speaks truth to her. Speaks some of the most powerful truths in the whole Bible. I am the resurrection and the life. Could there be a more powerful statement? It was no light thing that she got. But then, in verse 28... He said, when she had said this, when they had finished, she called her sister Mary, saying, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she went quickly and went to him. I said, Now Jesus has not yet come to the village. And it said, Mary rose quickly, went out, and came to where Jesus was. And she saw at him, and she said the exact same word. was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled and immediately went and raised Lazarus. See, she touched him. She touched him. Her her prayer moved God. And it wasn't any... See, the, the wording's exactly the same. It wasn't what she said. He's responding to something in her. And what was in her was what she said was a simple... It, it came from a pure spirit. It did not come from agenda. There was not an agenda. Why weren't you here? 
You see that? It was a simple statement of knowledge. I know if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. He responded to the intimacy and the trust and the lack of uh, pretense and pretending and religious gaga and agenda. He did not sense any of that in her. He saw a woman's heart open, lay bare, and not covered or protected by anything. And she shared her heart with him. She didn't share her agenda with him. She shared her heart, who she was, the essence of who she was. And her spirit stood and touched his spirit. And it moved him. Moved him. He moved him to emotion. Touched God's heart. She touched his heart. And he went and raised Lazarus from the dead in response. And I believe that we have the same opportunity to touch the heart of God. If we can let go of the agendas and the stuff that we go to him with and come with just who we are without pretense, without pretending, without um, trying to be something that we're not, trying to be spiritual or something. See, I think that's what Moses, I get the picture when Moses stood before the Lord, it was his, his naked spirit standing between the almighty God and the judgment on people that he wanted to bring. One man... He stood there without any pretense, without any right to prevail upon God. He laid down any right he had to get anything from God and that moved God because God is a God of compassion and He cares. Why God does not move in our lives so many times is because we come to Him with an agenda. We come to Him with pretense. We don't come to Him with just the, the pain in our heart or the, the confusion or the desire, whatever is real and really inside of us. You know, we come to Him with all the stuff, and His whole working in our life is to try to get around the stuff to who we really are. And so, basically, I think what the Lord wants to do is to get us to the place where we're willing to have him strip all that stuff away from us. So that, you know, can you imagine being able to touch and move God's heart for someone you love? You know, can you imagine being able to have that kind of a, a relationship with the Lord where you can stand before him and, and keep judgment coming on someone or something, you know? It just, you know, I, it just... It's an overwhelming thing to me to think that God cares so much that I can do that. That He cares about what I care about if I can just be honest about it. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. If I can be honest about it, He cares what I care about. It matters to Him. <laughs> that's, a, that's an amazing thing, and it's something the enemy does not want us to know. And I think that's all I have. <laughs>